Welcome to Unit 1, Chapter 13 on the Endocrine System. The reason we start in Chapter 13 in Anatomy 2 is in Anatomy 1, you ended with the nervous system, which was covered in Chapters 10, 11, and 12. And so this is kind of a continuation from Anatomy 1, and I understand that some of you took Anatomy 1, you know, maybe last semester or years ago. So I am going to try to review things from Anatomy 1 for you to help make those connections if it's been a minute. So in the nervous system, um, which includes the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, and the periphery, the sensory nerves and the motor nerves, those w work together to communicate within the body and keep you alive. You receive information from the environment, whether it be internal or external, send that to the central nervous system to integrate that information, and then send that to, to various motor neurons that innervate with either muscle, if you're needing to you know, move something, whether it be cardiac, skeletal, or smooth muscle. It can also um, help glands secrete um, whether it be endocrine or exocrine gland, their contents. And so we are here with the endocrine gland and endo means inside. So these chemicals will not be released to the outside like an exocrine gland would, but they're going to stay inside. And what's really weird about this system is that all of the organs of the endocrine system aren't connected. How is that possible for them to work together and not be connected? It's because these endocrine glands are going to release chemicals that can travel through the blood and blood, as you know, goes all over the body. And so we can get the signal to the appropriate place and then um, communication occurs between those two organs. So what are the major organs or glands of the endocrine system? The pituitary gland in the brain the thyroid gland in your throat, the parathyroid glands associated also with the thyroid, your adrenal glands which sit on top of your kidneys, your large uh, glandular pancreas which we will find is not only endocrine but also exocrine. Um, it's important for digestion. Your pineal gland found in the brain, uh, part of the diencephalon, the thymus, and uh, the thymus sits on your, top of your heart, and the ovaries and testes, depending on if you're biologically male or female, and those will be your reproductive organs, and, and they're glandular, so they release estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and other androgens. So here is a picture of the body and the glands that are associated with it. You should con consider learning where these are located. Uh, in our homework, which are called practices, they aren't practice tests. They are practicing the material. They are, you can treat them like a practice test, but it's really for you to practice learning. And uh, learning takes work. So you're gonna have to practice, and I want you to practice before the test. So I make it worth points, and, and we call it homework, and it helps people uh, tremendously. And one of your practices will have you um, dragging and dropping the names of these endocrine glands throughout the body. And perhaps a test question will have you do the same. So definitely know that your hypothalamus and your pituitary and pineal gland are associated with the brain, your parathyroid and thyroid in the throat, uh, named after the thyroid cartilage, or the thyroid cartilage maybe is named after the thyroid gland. Either way, in the throat. Thymus on the heart. You can't see the heart in this picture, but it's there. Uh, adrenal glands on the kidneys, the pancreas, um, very large gland, important gland, and then the ovaries and the testes for males and females. So I mentioned the endocrine glands uh, secrete hormones, uh, is what we'll call them, uh, or chemicals that stay inside the body. They are ductless, so there is no passageway for them to reach the outside. Where exocrine glands do have ducts or tubes that are going to lead to the body surface, whether that be in the stomach or in the intestines or in, you know, outside the, the skin. And 
some of you might be going, wait a minute, the stomach, the intestines, that's in the body. Well, technically that is still outside of the body because you have not passed a membrane, okay? You haven't crossed into any blood or um, across any epithelial tissue. So exocrine glands secrete things externally. And uh, so you should be thinking of like sweat or mucus or um, even mammary glands which secrete milk, um, gosh, uh, sebaceous glands. So lots of glands. And then, um, but we're going to focus on endocrine glands. Exocrine glands are usually talked about when you learn about the skin. Um, and then we'll, we'll hit some of them up with the digestive system. Other cells secrete chemical messages internally, and we call these local hormones. They're not real hormones um, because they don't go into the blood. A hormone will, tr will travel through blood, and so that's kind of where we make the differentiation. Because paracrine secretions don't go travel through the blood, they just go to cells nearby, um, we call them local hormones, but technically, you know, not. And then autocrine are, um, auto means self, and so these are chemicals that bind to the cell that released it, and it activates that cell to, to do something. So this is comparing like the thyroid gland and a uh, sweat gland, a exocrine, type of exocrine gland, sudoriferous gland. And so you can see that um, on B, the exocrine cells are releasing through phagocytosis some sweat, and that's actually going to travel to a duct and leave the body through the skin, where the endocrine uh, gland, the thyroid gland, is releasing hormones that eventually go into capillaries and travel into the blood through the whole, through the whole body, or, um, or to the whole body through the blood. We mentioned that the nervous system and the endocrine system work together, but we can also kind of see how they're alike and how they're different. So both of them are doing communication and both of them use chemicals. The nervous system, as you saw in Anatomy 1, uses something called neurotransmitters. And they release these into spaces called synapses. And the neurotransmitter could go from like, let's say a sensory neuron to an interneuron, or the interneuron could release neurotransmitters to talk to motor neurons, or motor neurons could talk to uh, glands or muscles. And so that, we call those neurotransmitters. The endocrine gland, secretes hormones and remember they're going into the bloodstream. The nervous system does respond a lot faster than endocrine gland but the effects of the endocrine gland definitely lo uh, last longer than the nervous system. And so here's a table from your book um, showing what the cells, neurons, and glandular epithelium do. So cells will secrete chemical signals um, we'll see this with like uh, white blood cells, um, helper T cells, for example. Neurons release neurotransmitter. Maybe you saw acetylcholine talking to a muscle to contract. And then glandular epithelium will release hormones. And so um, these cells have a specific action that they're wanting to happen or who they're they're targeting and so the neurons are always communicating with the cell after the synapse excuse me mm. sorry yes i have a silly sneeze um but so the neurons are talking to the cell whether it be another neuron or a gland or a muscle where the glandular epithelium, the, the endocrine, is looking for a target cell. And so while the chemical signal, the hormones going everywhere in the body, only cells with receptors for that chemical are gonna be able to understand the communication that's happening. And we call those cells target cells. Of course, neurons take less than a second, where epithelial tissue, getting releasing your hormone, um, and it traveling to where it needs to go can take anywhere from a few seconds to a few hours. Think about adrenaline. That happens pretty quickly. Um, and then how long does this take? Neurons very quick where your 
endocrine glands might be quick but can actually last for a few days after you've secreted. So this is what it looks like. You have a neuron releasing a neurotransmitter, This, in this case talking the skeletal muscle, and then the glandular cells releasing hormones into the bloodstream. Remember that blood goes all over the body, but only the target cells are going to be the cells that have the receptor that bind to that hormone and, and do communication. Both of them communicating. Uh, in A, the neurons telling the, the muscle to move. So maybe you hurt yourself and you're having a reaction, maybe a, a patellar um, reflex. Or in B, um, glandular cells, this could be, oh, I don't know, uh, LH traveling through the bloodstream um, causing ovulation. So there's a ton of hormones and their abbreviations, and we are going to need to know a few of these. Um, so what I love about this, you can star this page. It tells you the gland that's releasing the hormone, what the abbreviation is, and other names that are used to describe the hormone. So in our hypothalamus, um, remember the hypothalamus is in the brain, it's releasing quite a few hormones. So we have corticotropin releasing hormone and gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, of those two, GnRH is the one we would talk about more common in this course. And what gonadotropin does, well gonads are ovaries and testes, and anytime you see tropin or tropic, what that tells you automatically is that that hormone is going to target another endocrine gland to release yet another hormone. So what is gonadotropin releasing hormone doing? It's talking to the gonads to release hormones. Um, and they'll be tropic hormones. So another name for that is luteinizing hormone releasing hormone, which that is a mouthful as well. And that's just saying, hey, with GnRH, it's going to cause LH to be released. Um, there's somatostatin or growth hormone release inhibiting hormone. So that kind of tells you what it does. Um, growth hormone releasing hormone. <laughs> Prolactin release inhibiting hormone or dopamine, prolactin releasing factor, and they use the word factor because um, they just have all these proteins they haven't quite figured out the specific names for yet or identified them. And then there's thyrotropin releasing hormone. And so the hypothalamus is always talking pretty much to other glands. So the anterior pituitary gland um, is a major one. The pituitary gland is one of the master glands of the body and it releases so many hormones that are vital for um, our survival. And so we would uh, find that adrenocorticotropic hormone, so think about this, adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, is released by the anterior pituitary. Well, what caused the anterior pituitary to release that hormone? Well, it's the corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus in the brain told another part of the brain, the anterior pituitary, to release the adrenocorticotropin hormone, or just called corticotropin. The anterior pituitary also releases follicle stimulating hormone, growth hormone, luteinizing hormone, prolactin, and TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. I didn't go over the, the synonym, sorry. Um, most of those I don't use. I use the actual name, not the synonym, um, but I have heard of thyrotropin used for thyroid stimulating hormone. And just when you thought we were done, we still have other glands, right? The posterior pituitary, so the gland uh, towards the back, releases only two. So looking at the pituitary, who's the master gland? The anterior pituitary, because it really releases a ton of hormones. But the posterior has ADH, which we'll look at in detail when we look at um, how we make urine and um, the nephron of the kidneys. It's also called vasopressin. And then oxytocin. Um, 
The thyroid gland releases calcitonin and thyroxin and triiodothyroid. We call those T3s and T4s. The parathyroid gland uh, releases parathyroid hormone. That's an easy one, right? Uh, your adrenal medulla and adrenal cortex. So these are parts of the uh, adrenal gland. So remember that sitting on top of those kidneys. Medulla always meets the middle of it and cortex is always the outside. So in the middle of your adrenal gland, you have your adrenal medulla and that's where your epinephrine and norepinephrine um, are produced. They're called adrenaline because it's found in the middle of the adrenal gland. On the outside is adrenal cortex where we have aldosterone and cortisol and cortisol is called cortisol because it's coming from the cortex and so these names all mean something and I'm really a big advocate on learning what these prefixes and suffixes and word parts mean because if you know some of that you can see a word you've never seen before right and be able to kind of dissect it and figure out what it means another word for cortisol is hydrocortisone and then the pancreas, uh, very popular uh, gland, releases insulin, which is most what most people think of, but it also releases glucagon, the antagonist for insulin, as well as somatostatin. And so in the next uh, section, we're gonna talk about how hormones work. So hormones are released from the gland into the extracellular fluid move into the bloodstream and that is the transport like I've mentioned um, to go to the body. Now how they do that depends on the chemistry of the hormone. Is it lipid soluble or water soluble? Uh, lipid soluble uh, meaning it's nonpolar where water soluble um, hormones would be polar. And you only need a little bit of hormone to have you know huge effects on the body. So let's talk about the chemistry of hormones and see what I mean by uh, polar and nonpolar. So there are two general types of hormones. There's either steroid or steroid-like hormones. Those are the nonpolar ones. And then non-steroid hormones, which are polar. What does nonpolar mean? Well, fat is nonpolar. All lipids are nonpolar, and that's why they don't mix with water. And so these steroids don't mix with water well, but they do mix with other lipids well. So um, a steroid is this complex ring of carbon and hydrogen atoms, which is what lipids are made of, just hydrocarbons. So all of these steroid hormones are going to be made from cholesterol, a important steroid um, of the body. We find cholesterol in a few places, importantly in the cell membrane, but um, that was from a long time ago. And examples of steroid hormones are all your sex hormones and then the adrenal cortex hormones. So testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, all the androgens, and then adrenal cortex horm hormones, remember those are cortisol and aldosterone. So all of those are made from cholesterol, and that means they mix with lipids very easily. Now, non-steroid hormones don't mix with lipid. They mix with water very easily, and most of them have some association with protein. And if you think about like a protein shake, that mixes very easily with water. And so non-steroid or protein hormones uh, mix easily with water. So amines, as in like amino acids, are derived from tyrosine, a specific amino acid. And this is like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and thyroxine. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all the hormones and whether they're amine, protein, or peptide, or glycoproteins, but I do want you to, to hear these words. And, but I, I might ask you if they're non-steroid or steroid, right? It's real easy. Which ones are steroids? The sex hormones and the adrenal cortical cortex hormones. Everything else is, is non-steroid. Like I mentioned, uh, tyrosine is an amino acid that helps make up proteins. Some of the non-steroid hormones are proteins, long chains of amino acids, for example, the growth hormone. Or it could be short chains of amino acids, the peptides, ADH and oxytocin. And then glycoproteins are proteins that have a carbohydrate on it. So glyco means um, sugar. 
And so TSH is an example of that. And your book always likes to put things into a table. And quite honestly, these are what I always go to um, when I'm studying something because they're all the information. I don't have to read a bunch. It's just all right there. And so here's the types of um, hormones and what they're made from pretty much and uh, or made of and, and examples of them. If you look at them, they're structurally very different. So you can see cortisol and norepinephrine, parathyroid hormone, oxytocin, and then prostaglandin uh, two down there. And so this is just the chemistry. Look at that PTH. That is um, quite a few amino acids linked together. So that's a protein. And then a peptide is like oxytocin. It's a few of the amino acids um, together. And then cortisol, um, mainly made of hydrogen and carbon. All of those rings are hydrocarbon rings that were made from cholesterol. And same thing with the prostaglandin. So now that we know what hormones are made of and the classifications of hormones, and we've compared hormones to neurotransmitters, um, let's look at how uh, hormones affect things. And so hormones can affect metabolic processes by changing the enzyme or changing the membrane. Um, hormones deliver messages to, by binding to receptors on the target cell, I already mentioned that. And what happens is when that signal, the hormone is the signal, the receptors on the target cell, y'all have heard of signal and reception, you have a cell phone. Well, they named it a cell phone after this process. These are cells talking to one another. If you want your cell phone to talk to another, you have to have a signal and you have to have reception. And so the hormone is the signal and the target, who you're calling, has to have reception to get the signal. And um, this can cause those targets um, to, to change. So what's the purpose of talking to a cell to tell the cell to do something? With your cell phone, it's telling your cell phone to ring and say who said it or who's, who's calling or whatever. But for cells, it's for the cell to have some sort of effect. And um, cells can actually change the number of receptors based on the strength of the response and that might change this response. So upregulation is when a cell increases the number of re receptors. And this might be because there's such a low hormone level um, that they're gonna increase the number of receptors to increase the prob probability of reception occurring. Where if you have a whole lot of hormone, um, you don't need as many receptors, right? Because this hormone, this signal, this chemical is flooding everywhere. And so you might downregulate and reduce the number of receptors. Remember that steroid and um, some of the thyroid hormones have poor water solubility, mainly these steroids because they're made of fat. So they can't just travel through the blood because the blood is made of mainly what? Water. And these don't mix with water well. So how are we going to get these to flow through the blood? Well, you have to um, transport these hormones with a protein, which is soluble in water. And so there are some plasma proteins found in the plasma of the blood that bind to these steroids, and that allows them to be soluble in the water. So the steroid hormone um, can diffuse right through the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. Why? Well, because it's lipid, and lipid mixes with lipid. So the steroid hormone just goes on through the, the cell, um, and they think thyroid hormones are thought to enter by um, like a protein transporter. See how they're not quite sure? But uh, both are gonna bind to receptors inside the cell, and in, Specifically, I'm talking about steroids. They just move through the cell membrane, through the nuclear membrane, and you'll find them in the nucleus. And what is in the nucleus being held and stored and protected? The DNA. So oftentimes, in fact, all the time, steroids and thyroid hormones are going to cause transcription of a specific gene in the DNA. It's going to turn on a gene. And you're going to get a transcript, which is a copy of that gene. And what do cells do with that copy? Well, they use a ribosome to make the protein. And so this is quickly going to 
create a, a, a new protein being made. And so here's the sequence of a steroid hormone. The endocrine gland secretes the steroid right into the interstitial fluid, which goes right into the blood, but has to be carried with this transport protein because it's fat, it's from cholesterol, and the blood is lipid. Um, once the steroid unbinds, um, it diffuses into the target cell through the membrane, enter the cytoplasm, enter the nucleus. It can do that because it can pass through lipids pretty easy. And then it turns on genes in the DNA, um, makes a transcript, that's messenger RNA, where protein synthesis can occur. And so here's a picture of this, and you can see how this steroid hormone, it almost looks like cholesterol. It, it could, well, why? Because it's made from cholesterol. So. It enters right through the cell membrane, has no problem entering, uh, can go into the nucleus, no problem, and then turns on genes in the, to make uh, protein. So how do non-steroids hormones transport? Transport Well, non-steroids are not fat, so they can't go through the membrane because the membrane's fat. And remember, only fat mixes with other fat. So these non-steroid hormones, while they mix with water well, they don't mix with fat. You've seen oil and vinegar, right? They don't mix. So non-steroid hormones would mix with vinegar very well. And because of that, they can't go through the cell membrane. So what, how do they get in? They have to bind to receptors on the target membrane. Outside, you'll see receptors sitting on the outside where the steroid receptors, if you remember, were inside, maybe even in the nucleus. So the hormone binds to the receptor and they call that the first message. The hormone, if it's non-steroid, will never enter the cell, okay? Non-steroid hormones cannot get through the cell membrane. But what they do is bind to receptors outside the membrane and that causes changes that release another chemical internally. And that we call that the second messenger. And the second messenger could be things like uh, calcium two plus ions. We see that in muscles, but um, more commonly it's cyclic AMP. Um, so cyclic adenosine monophosphate. This is a cousin of ATP, the uh, adenosine triphosphate, um, but this is a second messenger that can cause an effect in the cell. And this whole process is called signal transduction pathway, and we could have like weeks to talk about it. But um, so this is the sequence. You can pause the video and walk through that again if you want to, but here's a good picture of it. Remember where steroid membranes would just go through the membrane. Non-steroid membranes cannot go through this layer of fat. So they bind to this receptor on the membrane surface. What that causes is um, changes to happen within the cell that cause enzymes to release cyclic AMP. That cyclic AMP then activates other enzymes and you have a cascade of enzymes getting activated, which is gonna cause the cell to do some um, some change. We know that hormones are abused and here are three really common ones. We're going to see erythropoietin come in quite a few times so star that one. It might not be on this test but it's going to be on future tests. I think three of our units talk about erythropoietin. So here's three types of hormones that athletes often um, will abuse to increase their, their athletic abilities. Most people think of steroids, and so steroids are going to help um, with the muscular strength, and um, so we're talking about testosterone, uh, even progesterone maybe, I think. But what's the harmful effects? Well, when you start using a hormone, the you know, synthetically, <coughs> Your, your natural hormones don't need to be released anymore. And so you might downregulate and stop, you know, stop producing that hormone altogether. And so that could eventually stunt your growth. Uh, for males, this could mean breast development because you're no longer producing testosterone. Um, you might see male sexual characteristics in females like uh, a beard or mustache or a deeper throat. It can damage your kidneys and other organs. Um, and then they say psychiatric problems. Well, we might all have that, right? Just kidding. JK. 
Um, the other one that people actually really use in addition to testosterone is GH. And that makes your muscles actually larger. So people who are wanting to look bigger are going to use GH and then um, build more muscle. And like I said, it's usually used along with steroids. Now, your erythropoietin is pretty neat. Urethro means red. And so this erythropoietin's natural job is to leave the liver and it goes to um, the bone marrow and tells the bone to make more blood make more red blood cells and if you have more red blood cells you can carry more oxygen if you can carry more oxygen you don't get tired as fast and your muscles can do more work and so uh, we can use erythropoietin with help with an anemia but this can lead to a heart attack and even death and so people need to be uh, careful of that so we're going to pause here with our first video lecture and take a break and uh, when you're ready watch the second video where we'll start talking about the actions of prostaglandins.